recording. Um, welcome to R4D. Um, it's great to see everyone out on this first Monday after Labor Day, where I know the traffic is like the worst ever. Um, I'm Gina Lagomarsino. I'm the CEO here at, at R4D. And as I, hopefully many of you know, our mission is to support change agents who are building strong health and education systems. And given that mission, our education team spends a lot of time working to try to build strong, um, uh, practical global knowledge on really important issues like education technology and early childhood development and um, uh, education financing, but more importantly, working to try to get that knowledge into practice um, with change agents in countries through various models like collaborative learning and adaptive learning and direct uh, technical assistance and capacity building in countries. So that's what we do in education generally, although occasionally we like to have a forum like this if there's a good topic for discussion. And we've done a few of these over the last year or two. And I'm really delighted that today we have a very interesting and provocative question that we're all going to be addressing, which is, is the international education aid architecture broken? Um, but probably more importantly, what are some things we can do to try to improve that art architecture so that we can get to better learning outcomes for kids around the world? Um, so that's our topic of conversation today. We were so delighted when we put the idea for this out, out there that we got such great response from basically all of the major global institutions that are part of that architecture. And there was a lot of interest um, in participating in this panel, and therefore we have a fantastic panel we're going to um, be having a good discussion today. And it's great to see such a great turnout um, here in person. I think we may have some people that have joined us um, via webinar too. So if you're listening from someplace else in the world, we welcome you as well. Um, so uh, this was actually all inspired by my colleague, Nick Burnett, um, who uh, was asked uh, several months ago to contribute an essay on this question about the global aid architecture for education. Um, and he wrote this article that was per published in the Journal of Education Development. And lots of folks have responded to that article. It's been exciting. Um, and so we're going to start off with Nick sharing um, his, his, some of his views that come from that article, just in case you haven't read it. I think Nick is actually quite well um, positioned to critique the aid architecture because he spent many years um, working in several of the big institutions that he talks about, including the World Bank and UNESCO. Um, and then, of course, he was our first um, uh, managing director for education here at R4D. He uh, founded that practice here, and he's now one of our senior fellows. So um, the way we're going to work this is Nick is going to get up and share some of the thoughts he put into that essay as food for thought. And then after that, I'm going to invite up our distinguished panel, and we will hopefully have a very lively discussion about it. So that is the plan. Um, and I will turn it over to Nick. Thank you very much, and uh, Gina. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, a very big turnout for a, mo a Monday morning. Um, so, as Gina uh, said, um, there are various origins to this uh, to this um, uh, essay that I wrote for International uh, Journal of Educational Development, whose editor, by the way, uh, Steve Heinemann, is here and who, in who invited me to to, to do this. Um, but part, part of the origin has to do with uh, a paper we actually wrote for the. Um, Education Commission a few years ago, which perhaps didn't get a lot of attention about uh, issues around what to do about this. Okay, uh, which perhaps didn't get as much attention as it should have. Um, and uh, but part of it also has, is personal. Uh, <laughs> 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 I've had all those years' experience with public speaking. <laughs> Anyway, part of it is personal because, um, you know, none of us is, you know, I'm not as young as I used to be. And I started thinking about, well, what did I do? Or what did I not do? And I started feeling uh, not so good about what I had not managed to do. Of course, I felt good about what I had managed to do, like help with R4D, but not so good about some of the other things I'd done, including some of my time at uh, UNESCO. So um, that's that's been a bit the, the origins of all of this. Um, let me uh, just define terms to <coughs> just get us started. So nothing very profound. 
Uh, what I want to talk about is the set of international agencies and institutions that get resources to support countries' education development. And of course, they get those resources mainly from rich countries, governments, though beginning to get also from philanthropies and so on. This is really not good. Can we do something about it? Can we move further forward? <laughs> Excuse me. If everybody who's mic doesn't mute their mic, we might get the feedback. So oh, you're right. sorry, it might be my fault. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, the current context obviously is uh, SDG four, which, um, as I will explain in a few minutes, I think is a big disaster. Uh, not to say it hasn't got some good aspects to it. Um, but I also want to say that although the uh, title of today's uh, panel uh, is around aid architecture, I actually think of this in a very broad terms, not just about money, at least, but about other things too uh, that are very important. Um, so the, here are some of the uh, institutions, you know, so alphabet soup of, that are uh, involved in this international architecture. And I just, I just highlighted in red the ones of the panel panel members today. But as you can see, it's a lot of institutions, actually. Um, and some of them somewhat temporary, like Education Commission, but most of them pretty permanent. And just to remind, especially people who don't work on education, well, why, why would the education architecture matter? Do we care? Why do we care about it? Which is really a different question. Why do we care about education? And I'm not going to go into that in any depth today, obviously, but just to rehearse the well-known points that, you know, education is crucial for economic growth, it's crucial for individual development, it's crucial for social cohesion. In this SDG world, it's crucial for the other SDGs. And, of course, as uh, artificial intelligence comes along, becomes an increasingly important question. <laughs> what, uh, what sort of education do we need in such a world? But uh, despite its importance, there remain these enormous challenges. And here, I think, uh, again, this is part of my personal frustration, and I think that of some other people who've been involved in this work for some time, that we're now on to our you know, third set of goals for education. Um, they're very, with, they've changed a bit, but not frankly, Fantastically, they're basically all about getting children into school and now be more explicit about learning. But all these, each time we fail to meet these goals, and we fail pretty dramatically, actually, um, with one possible exception, which is around gender, where things have improved uh, a lot. But we still have the same number of, same absolute number of children out of school as we did a decade ago. We still have, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say, most children, at least in low-income countries, uh, most children in school, unfortunately, not learning properly. We still have a, we still have, and we are increasingly having a massive youth unemployment issue, in part because of the lack of skills. Not only in part, of course, there are obviously macroeconomic issues. Um, we still have very inadequate financing for education, both domestic and international. Um, regardless of whose estimates you take. Mm -hmm. uh, we find that the amounts available are well below what anybody thinks they should be. And we have, of course, a particular set of issues around low-income countries uh, in Africa, which uh, remain very much, uh, many of which remain very stuck. So what I tried to do in this uh, paper was to try and think, uh, not, I th not very profoundly, I think, but just to try to list well, what do I think an architecture ought to do? And I came up with uh, six things. But then, and then I discuss in that paper, you know, how I think the, uh, the architecture is actually doing on those things. Well, to make it a bit more interesting today, I decided to actually include a grade on an A to E grade scale. So nobody, no, I, nobody's going to fail, but um, <laughs> we're a progressive school here. But, 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 uh, but uh, I think you'll see that, uh, and I'll discuss these in a second, that overall, I'm not thinking, I don't think that the architecture is functioning very well. So I, of these six things, first one I think which is crucial is uh, leadership. So I already mentioned this SDG4. And my question simply is, how could it be that a group of responsible people 
from the international agencies, of course, working with politicians and so on, could come up with a goal, or which has many sub goals, of course, which is inherently not achievable. Why would they do that? Well, the answer would be presumably because they want to have some sort of stretch goal. But still, don't you think it would have been a good idea? I do. To have had something a bit more practical, one. And secondly, a bit more uh, adjusted to um, the um, different situations in different parts of the world. Uh, so, for instance, just to give one example, it is absolutely impossible to meet the SDG for secondary education goal, because for that to be met, every child would already have to be in primary school. And they're not. It's just technically impossible. Um, the second thing about uh, um, leadership, I think, is, well, with all respect to everybody here and uh, others too, could we really name a world leader who is a champion of education? We can name some former leaders who run commissions and things, but could we really run a name a current world leader who's a champion of education? I don't think we can. So that's extremely worrying. That's not just the architecture, of course, but I believe it's also a failure of the architecture, and so on. So I, on the leadership point, I, uh, uh, in a sense of promoting sensible approach to world education, I give a very, very low grade of E. But then the second area is an area that people don't talk about a lot, especially in Washington. Um, it's around, I think it's a very important area, around sort of norms and standards, including all sorts of international conventions, including international recognition of degrees and that sort of thing. And here, uh, actually, I think, uh, maybe because there's only one agency largely doing this, which is UNESCO, actually, uh, things are going reasonably well. Um, not not so fantastic, but they're going reasonably well. Third area has to do with technical and knowledge support. So here I think there's a huge problem. Um, the uh, statistics function, uh, international statistics function of uh, UNESCO is, is, is close to collapse, yeah, inadequate funding. Um, there's a, a lot of research going on, but we don't know what it all means altogether. All I realize I'm making massive generalizations. <laughs> um, there's a, there are various uh, things around to try to promote innovation, but they don't really seem to be coming together. I distinguish also the, the, the generation of knowledge, which I've just been talking about, and the providing support, knowledge support, especially to uh, low-income countries that need it, where we, don't, where we have, again, not a lot of knowledge about what to do around joint learning, around training support, and so on, but scale of what's happening it's very, very small. Fourth area has monitoring. Well, here the main mechanism is the Global Education Monitoring Report, which I used to be director of at one point um, when it had a different name. Um, and here that, that report is doing a good job, but limited, I think. Um, it's not set up to really do a detailed evaluation of an individual country's performance, more looking at the world as a whole. Um, it is looking somewhat at donors. It used to, in the past, look at how this architecture was functioning, but now it doesn't much. And in part, I think that the fact it doesn't do all of this is because, next point five, there is no good accountability system. Really, frankly, both countries and donors can do what they want. Well, maybe they should because they're sovereign, but they can, do, I, they can basically change what they do and there might be a little fuss but nothing really happens. There's really no consequence. There's no sort of implicit contract of any type. Finally, uh, aid itself, money. Um, as I said earlier, by any, any whatever <coughs> estimates you want to use of needs, the current flows are inadequate, both sorry, financing both domestic and international. Secondly, country-specific finance, does it really go to the right places? Only 30% of aid, education aid, goes to low-income countries. Only 30%. Um, only, I think it's 24%, 24, 25% of aid for education is multilateral, compared to about 45 for health. Um, 40 to 45 for health. Recently, there's been good moves to try to get funding into for refugees and emergencies and so on, though the numbers again remain low. And finally, we have a big problem around uh, the financing of global public goods in education. I mentioned already statistics, but there are other things too. Uh, many other things, knowledge, research, etc. 
and here something like three percent of the uh, international education spend is on global public goods in health it's 21 uh, percent i don't think it should be 21 percent in education by the way because we're not doing drug research and so on but but still it should be i believe a lot more than three so here this is my for me the most important slide i'm presenting to you uh, my kind of assessment of how things are and you see i give pretty medium or low grades on all these dimensions i also have a problem with the representativeness or lack of it i don't think developing countries still have a sufficient voice there are some institutions like gp have made a big effort to give them a voice and i'm also very bothered by the fact that private education accounts for about uh, one-fifth of global education it doesn't really have a voice the so-called private sector voice in many of these institutions is actually the voice of the private philanthropy or the voice of um, uh, the, the private business sector, not necessarily the, educate, the private education sector. Another way to think about all of this is that, uh, uh, here I'm indebted to uh, Birger Fredriksson, my former colleague at the World Bank, who, who <coughs> discussed this a lot, uh, to argue that the systems, that what we should have is a global system that helps improve national education systems, but we don't really have that. And it's especially a big problem in uh, education in uh, low income countries, especially in Africa. How did this all this happen? Um, well, I used to work at UNESCO, as uh, Gina mentioned, and I think that a lot of the problem, at least around the knowledge, not so much around the money, uh, has to do with the politicization of UNESCO. And I don't just mean by this uh, the whole sort of business around uh, Palestine and so on, which of course led to the US withdrawal, but I mean much more broadly politicization. Almost every action that UNESCO takes uh, gets politically infused. When I was there, literally every afternoon, I received some ambassador or two who wanted jobs for that, that person's nationals. Literally, Lit quite literally, I'm not exactly. I think also there are too many agencies, especially providing general funding for education. By contrast, some other sectors, we have more, the same, quite a lot of agencies, but they're providing specific funding, for specific things. Um, we find these agencies themselves competing for other people's money. We find the World Bank competing with GPE to get Gates Foundation money. This seems a bit, is this really very sensible? Um, Similarly, I think the bilaterals, um, uh, of course, they're not, they're not by definition multilaterals, but they are the countries which are funding the multilateral system. Uh, maybe they are not taking sufficient leadership role with regard to the, the, to the multilateral system. I mentioned already the low proportion of total funding, which is multilateral, um, but also there's a question, I think, of the engagement of the major countries that are the major <coughs> bilateral education actually in the multilateral system, and so on. I argue, as you can see in that subtitle, that there's been too much politics, what I just described, but I also think there hasn't been enough politics in the sense of politics being the art of the compromise. So, uh, of course, if you want to deal with a problem, you have to first recognize it. It was uh, disappointing to me, although I uh, was a bit involved with the Education Commission, the commission didn't really tackle this question of the architecture it certainly tackled the question of financial flows but didn't really tackle the question of the architecture um i think that um a lot of the uh agencies are very very blunt very disparaging of each other in private not in public of course but, uh, but very disparaging in in private and this is a big problem there's a serious lack of, of mutual respect among the different agencies um I, I've heard World Bank people, you know, bad mouth GPE, I've heard everybody bad mouth UNESCO, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've heard many people bad mouth the World Bank. So, so it's just, there seems a lack of trust. Huh? And I'm not saying that is true of the sort of people who are going to be on our panel at the highest level, but just in a more pervasive. It's a problem, I think, of lack of mutual trust, mutual respect, which is quite serious. Well, I really mentioned the problem of the goal. I think if there was a better international goal, it would be a lot easier to coalesce. But I do think that the, when we try and boil everything down, we come, we come to two principal sources of, of the overall architecture problem we have. One has been the decline of UNESCO on the technical side. 
And the second has been this proliferation of general financing rather than specific financing. So how might we fix this? Oops, sorry. Um, I think we can learn some things from other sectors, health sector, which here Alfred Eagan know a lot about, um, where we have clearer goals, where we already, where we have much less competition for general funds, but a lot of specific funds. Uh, we have fairly good joint learning system and so on. Uh, economics and finance, IMF and World Bank separately have done a pretty good job of getting macroeconomic regional training centers and strengthening mechanisms into place around the world. And there's a lot that could be learned from that. It's no accident that very few low-income countries these days are, are all that are particularly poorly managed macroeconomically. Think about it. They're not. They're not. They used to be. And that's definitely due uh, in large part to this. And then even in our own sector in the past, uh, there was a cooperative agreement, for instance, between the World Bank and UNESCO, where things were pretty well spelled out and where they worked uh, reasonably well. All that uh, has declined. So, but the point being that it's not impossible. Other sectors have done it. We are, our own sector has done it. So finally, what might be done? Well, here I distinguish what I think would be great as opposed to what I think might be feasible. So what would be great, I think, would be to have a new UN agency for education. Uh, I don't think that's feasible right now. Yeah, the idea of creating a new agency, new UN agency in the present world climate is very feasible. But it would have one advantage, that it would allow the US at least to be part of it. So think about it. Um, uh, and maybe that agency or something like it could also handle the funding of global public goods. We need some, I believe we need some centralized way of, of, of dealing with that. Uh, I already suggested that maybe should be fewer general funding mechanisms and more specific ones, things like books or schools or what have you. Um, but as I say, I think that's uh, probably not realistic, certainly not realistic this year. Um, so what might be done? Well, I think it wouldn't be too hard to get everyone to agree to work together on a small number of things which everyone would agree were crucial. And I suggest there are three such things. The one is some sort of global discussion about the future of education. And to be fair, UNESCO has initiated something around that, but it's very much UNESCO, not wider. Um, secondly, I think is to crack this problem of the global public goods funding. I mean, we're only talking about needing two to three hundred million dollars in an assured way. That is all. Yet somehow we cannot get that funding put in place. And thirdly, I think because the situation is so serious and the future so dire, unless something happens, we really need to have a massive effort together to do with the African governments to give Africa a special push. There have been various uh, attempts or suggestions that there should be new funds and so on for Africa. I don't think that's a good idea, but I do think something very specific built around getting the technical support in, in order that these countries can take, can absorb much more money. Because right now, all those estimates of the money they need are not practical because they can't actually absorb the funds, even if you can sort of theoretically show that to enroll X children, you need Y money. So these are, this is basically what uh, I would suggest, that actually focusing on Africa um, is the key to sorting out this uh, broken international architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, you know, Julie, why don't you sit here? Um, Jaime, why don't you sit here? That looks going to be challenging in my dress. I'm being honest, you're good as well. Mm -hmm. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Nick. That's lots of food for uh, 
thought for all of us. And I hope we can now have a really interesting conversation among representatives from many different institutions. Let me do a quick introduction. Some of these people don't need much introduction, but I will give a, a quick uh, overview of who's on the panel. First, we're delighted to have Julie Cram, who is the USA Deputy Assistant Minister for the Bureau of um, Economic Growth, Education, and Environment. I had to read that because it's a mouthful. I know that means that you basically are the head of education at USAID and also lead all the work on gender empowerment. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Um, next, we have Zingai Mutambuka, who's I think most important claim to fame right now is that he's an r board member, which I'm delighted about. He's our best and most engaged board member. I don't know if we have any other board members. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> Zingai also, um, as many of you know, um, was the uh, Minister of Education for Zimbabwe decades ago um, and then had a long career at the World Bank and now is on many boards and he's actually faculty at the Harvard Ministerial Leadership Initiative. So he's engaging a lot with current ministers in both um, education and health. Happy to have you here, Zingai. Um, and next we have uh, Jaime Saavedra, who's currently the head of education for uh, the World Bank. Um, I think that title is senior director. Um, and, okay, what, what's global, director. global director? Yes, things keep changing. So um, <laughs> we'll see next time here, you're here. We'll maybe have new words. Um, but we're delighted to have you here. Um, Jaime was also, of course, the uh, Minister of Education for Peru. We have two former ministers on the panel, which is wonderful to have that perspective as well. Uh, next, we have Rob Jenkins, who is currently the head of education at UNICEF, recently came into that position. He has many decades of experience at the agency, much of it in countries that have ranged, I think, from India and Bangladesh to, I have to go back and read, but several African countries as well, Mozambique, um, and I think most recently, Jordan. Um, so all over the world and different, um, very different sort of context has worked on actual implementation of education programs. So that's a really important perspective now leading UNICEF. Um, and then last but not least, Joe Bourne, who recently took on the new role of um, chief, it's chief technical officer, right, of, of the Global Partnership for Education, GPE, is now commuting down to DC from New York. Um, but uh, most uh, recently was was at uh, UNICEF as the head of education and also had a long career at DFID, both at, in um, headquarters and in a number of different countries as well. So we're so delighted to have you all here. Um, and our hope is that this is going to be an interactive conversation where we'll go through a few key themes that Nick brought up and get the panelists discussing um, their views on those themes. And then we want to spend some time at the end to let audience members get in with questions and any perspectives you may have too. Um, but I thought a good way to start this um, would be to do a quick lightning round where we go down the panel. And I'd love for each person to just quickly say one thing they really agree with um, for, about what Nick, Nick said earlier or what's in his paper and one thing they disagree with just to kind of get the debate going. Is that, is that okay? Sounds great. Great, Julie, you wanna start? Sure. Yes, and please do turn your mics on when you start to speak. I think that's probably the best. Yeah. Great. So first, I just want to say thank you so much for having us. Um, uh, and, and Nick, thank you for, for your report. I think it does a really terrific job in laying out the key issues. Um, and, uh, and so with that, I'll just say quickly what I agree with and one or two things that I don't. Um, the, the first thing is I agree very much that um, that that the aid architecture isn't necessarily fit for purpose. Um, and uh, is that me? <laughs> I think it's you. I may be. Okay. Uh, so not fit. Uh, not fit for perk. Not fit for purpose. In that, um, as you so rightly noted out, and we all know, we're just not achieving the outcomes that we need to achieve. Um, after you know, after a lot of money um, and a lot of time. Uh, and I particularly agree with um, your, your point about the voice, the voice of our country partners uh, in particular, um, and also the voice of uh, the private sector, um, uh, both at the multilateral table, but also just in general and how much 
um, it represents in terms of the overall innovation and, and funding levels and partnership that I think we all, uh, that I think we need to have. Um, not surprisingly, I'm sure I disagree with uh, the fact that we need a new global initiative. Um, but um, having now look at looking at how you've presented kind of the practical piece, um, I think the idea of um, uh, finding a way for us to better convene um, and coordinate is critical. Uh, as you know, we have a U.S. government strategy. Um, many of you in this room work very hard uh, to get the READ Act passed. And so a big part of what we're trying to do at the U.S. government level, um, both here in Washington and at the country level, is that efficiency and coordination factor. So how can we do that without creating another multilateral agency, um, uh, particularly, quite frankly, no, no, uh, with all due respect to my U.N. friends in the room, um, uh, particularly at the U.N. Um, so uh so with that all that was my lightning round great thank you so much julie uh zingai i also want to say that uh, nick is a very courageous uh, person uh, in, in writing this paper uh, probably it was uh, it was time that the essay was produced uh, without um Offending Nick or my uh, uh, friend uh, Steve, they seem to have connived together to produce uh, uh, this report. Uh, I would like to say what I like about the paper is that uh, Nick wrote it. <laughs> what I don't like about it is that he should not have written it. <laughs> uh, more seriously, though. Um, I think we all agree that the architecture is, is broken. Um, where perhaps we have problems is um, how do we fix it? And here, really, I, I think that education is one of those stubborn, persistent problems that confront us. Um, I, I think, for example, for uh, the drug crisis in this country. It's one of those stubborn problems that confronts the country. But the little that I have seen by way of effort in this country is that uh, the US government has made so much effort concentrating on the supply side of drugs and really paid very little attention to the demand side. I think if you are going to solve this problem, you need to look at both sides. And I guess that if you apply this to education, I think it's important if we are going to think about the architecture, that we don't just think in terms of uh, the aid that goes to developing countries in need. We also look at the other side. From my perspective, I really think that we spend far too much time just focusing on the little amount of money that goes to support education in developing countries and far less effort on helping countries use their resources properly. Yeah. That would be my take. Great. Thanks, Tengai. Jaime, something you agree with and something you disagree with? Okay. John, thank you. Um, uh, so um, I have a long list of all the, the disagree and agree, uh, <laughs> and agree column. Um, so, but let, let me start with, with the agree. So I, I definitely we, I, I would agree with a lot of, a, a lot, not necessarily all, but all of the diagnosis of the uh, lack um, and the lack of investment and that we have not done enough collectively uh, in terms of money, in terms of technical assistance, in terms of global public goods, standards, monitoring. Yes, we have not been uh, done, done enough. Um, and, but it's, it's not like, uh, well, we, have, we should improve, we have not done enough, right? So everything's always improvable. I, I think, no, it's really we have not done enough because, and that's why we're living a learning crisis. So we don't have a learning problem. Right, we have a learning crisis. So the magnitude of the problem that we face collectively in terms of what's the level um, in terms of access and quality of education globally, 
we are not living up. We don't have a problem, right? We have a crisis. So I, I think there's an issue of magnitude when we say we have not done uh, enough. Um, I agree that uh, the way they have been crafted, the SDG goals will not be met. Hence, we need to change and create another set of more simpler goals consistent with what will be consistent with the IDGs, but it will be something that will help us to guide our work in a more effective way and defining targets that are tough but achievable. Right? If you have a target that is <coughs> completely unachievable, then it ends up being an irrelevant target. So, um, but let me um, let me discuss a little bit more, uh, a little more about that. How can we uh, frame the issue of goals later? Third, uh, I agree that um, this is I like that very much. One of the in a, and it was also a title of one of your slides when you say this is a, about a global system to support national uh, national capacity. And that is the part then that let me go there to the disagreement. One is that um, I think in this paper, the role of national government should be, even if we're talking about the international aid, aid architecture, should be much larger. Why? Because everything at the end of the day happens in terms of national policy. At the end of the day, everything happens there, right? For a government, and you have been a minister, so when you're a, you're, you're, you're a minister, Actually, you don't care a lot about the discussions in Washington, Paris, London. Mm -hmm. uh, you care about what's happening in your country. So if those discussions can help you, fantastic, <coughs> right? But only, only if things percolate and imply a change in mindsets at the country level, then something will happen. If that change in mindsets in priorities, uh, in sense of urgency, does not change at the country level, then nothing is happening. Mm -hmm. right? So that, I, I think that linkage is something that we will have to have uh, very present. Um, I disagree with some of the gossip, because as far as I know, the meetings between Gates and Joe, myself, have been trilateral. <laughs> Maybe Dick Nix has some uh, intelligence that we don't have, so we need to, um, uh, and, and And finally, I, my final point in terms of the disagreement is that this idea that it's bad to have several financing platforms of, or agencies, I think that's not the problem. There could be several financing agencies. The problem exists when you go from there to have a very unstructured dialogue precisely at the national level. Right, when the, and the national level, and particularly in low-income countries, you have many actors, many players, uh, many inconsistent either advice or discussions, then that's where the problem uh, arises. So for me, it's not a problem in terms of the fun, a, a plethora of institutions on the funding side, but the problem is when you go from there to the, uh, to the real sector, right, to the, uh, to the real discussion, that you have a lot of um, uh, different and, and uncoordinated uh, voices. I think we need to separate the issue of financing from all the other stuff related to the uh, the specific global public goods, the uh, the technical assistance, etc. So I would, I would separate those uh, those dimensions. Let me leave it there at this point. Thank you so much, Jaime. Um, Rob. Thank you. I'm just going to build right on from where Jaime left off. Um, this is all new to me. I've just been in this job for three months, and so I spent the last 25 years, as I mentioned, in eight different countries working for UNICEF and exactly what Jaime had said, everything happens there. Um, I mean, we're an organization of doing, we don't think much, you know, uh, UNICEF, we just do. <laughs> we leave the, we leave the thinking uh, to others. Um, and this is where I think I agree. Uh, first of all, I applaud Nick for opening up this conversation, et cetera, but I don't agree with a lot of the solutions because a little like what Jaime said, everything happens at country level. Frankly, this conversation in this room and whether there's an SDG or not, and whether it's so far removed. And you could issue any pamphlet or any little card about the next SDG and where, but to trans, for that to influence the conversation in, in, in Maputo or in Lusaka or wherever, it's, uh, it's just, it's not, it doesn't translate into change. And on the comment of lack of accountability, I also would disagree with that, just in the sense that I think there's enormous amounts of misdirected accountability. What I mean by that is, again, coming from country level, the amount of time and energy we spend 
uh, we meaning the government, the national governments with ourselves and UNICEF and others, satisfying accountability requirements is enormous. Reports, and visits, and audits, and et cetera. So we are accountable, I think, globally, international argument for specific um, projects um, and spending the money effectively on that project. Um, and that's, but we're not accountable for the overall <coughs> systems change that's required in order to address the learning crisis. And that's a longer term play. And that definitely, I agree with you, or not enough politics in the sense of that's often political at national level and others to deal with vested interests and work this through. When I mean system, I don't mean public by any means. I take the point. I mean the entire, everyone at national level that's delivering a learning opportunity and providing learning opportunity. So there, we are not held accountable for that, and there, hence the learning crisis. So to advocate for more specific financing and less general financing is, again, just exactly in the opposite where we want to go. That means more specific project accountability, very expensive um, at the global level and at national level. And again, it's not addressing the key issue, which is an overall systems change. Now, where has it worked? That's the other. It's like at the international level, it's scary. There are amazing innovations that have generated change at national level, systems change, that have revolutionized access and learning. So why has that worked? That's where we have to analyze, and maybe that's where I'll pick up in my next uh, comment, but where has it worked? But the solutions, unfortunately, but again, I think it's coming from different backgrounds. It's from a global perspective, um, but that's not, uh, that's not where the, the, the gains will be made. Thanks, Rob. Joe? <laughs> it's definitely advantage of disadvantage of coming last because I don't agree with this. I mean, first of all, thank you very much, Gina, for inviting us here, and thank you, Nick, for the paper. And I agree with you know a lot of the diagnosis and a lot of the things that this is shaking up in terms of the conversation. Um, I think the thing I want to pick up on in terms of agreeing was actually something Nick said just now in the beginning. I was going to say, you know, obviously, I agree with more finance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, this idea that we need to come together um, around a simpler set of prioritised goals in terms of the external finance. There needs to be more political impetus to come together. And I would push that even further. And this is what Zingai has said, what, what all of you have said, actually, is that coming together needs to happen at the country level. You know, we can have a global conversation, but that coming together is not happening as well as it could and actually as well as it has done to some extent in the past. I mean, I started my career in country level in the days of sector-wide approaches. Some of you will remember those. But the concept around that was how do we come together at country level to support the priorities of government moving forward. That was that kind of overarching concept. And we talked about things like jointly monitoring efforts together, about how we would make sure we would align our technical assistance and capacity, how we would use our financing to bolster and support um, the government systems, um, recognising that actually external aid is only a very small fraction of what, what needs to move the dial. It's the, it's the domestic piece that works. And what I'm seeing now moving into GP is we're kind of stagnating on that conversation and on that direction. When you get down to country level, everyone, as Robert said, is accountable to somebody else over here who says, no, now you do this, now you do this, now you do that, not accountable to actually the dialogue that's going on in country led by national governments. And so I think that's the piece that we need to be uh, you know, pushing this alignment um, agenda forward and stepping forward as international agencies with footprints on the ground to be able to to really support the priorities of government moving forward. Now, the bit I disagree with, coming back to the global level, um, not convinced we need a new mechanism for global public goods. I'm bound to say that, having just launched kicks in the last few months. Um, but do really agree that we need more financing for global public goods. But I think, again, we need to go a little bit further than that. It's actually thinking about the culture of global public goods in, in education and how do we incentivize the take up of good evidence by national partners, the capacity for national partners to really absorb good evidence and to learn from each other, which is different than health, obviously, to learn from each other in order to be able to really drive forward the most impactful interventions with their finance. And I think that's a really sort of, there's a bit of a golden opportunity in that space um, where if we could come together a bit more around that, I don't think it needs a new mechanism. I do think it needs us thinking more intelligently about strengthening the ecosystem around global public goods.
Great. Thank you, Joe. And thank you to all of uh, the panelists for getting us going. I don't think, Nick, you have to go running screaming from the room because I think there was enough agreement. But there's definitely, you know, some food for discussion. Um, I, I think that the one main theme we heard from almost every panelist was the role of countries, the, the need for more voice, the need to recognize that they're using a lot of their own resources, the need for the global architecture to be able to come together effectively in countries. And that there's uh, there's a lot of need for that. We also started to have some big conversations about accountability and where that should lie and and financing, et cetera. So um, where I'd like to take us next is let's let's focus on the first theme that Nick um, um, critiqued in his report, which is on this global leadership question. Um, and I'd like to actually start that conversation by going to Jaime. And before we dive back into education, um, I'm curious um, if we can do any learning from other sectors. So. Uh, the bank obviously works in many human development sectors and, and other non-human development sectors. Are there any lessons for global leadership that come um, from other sectors that we should be having in mind as we talk about education? Um, so let me, let me mention um, one thing, one area in which I think the bank and the international community has been successful in terms of positioning of, uh, um, a problem with a clear sense of urgency, right? And that was poverty. And uh, at some point, what about 20 years ago or more, right? There was this idea, okay, let's calculate this one single number, the one dollar a day, um, and say, look, this is um, uh, is outrageous, right? That there are people living in one dollar a day. And on the other hand, that that number, one dollar a day, which uh, draw a lot of criticisms in terms of the technical grounds, um, had a huge advantage of being something very simple to capture the attention of everyone, right? Not the poverty experts. Actually, at the end of the day, the poverty experts, in many instances, are, they're the irrelevant audience. What matters is the broad audience of decision makers and the public that says, yes, I mean, that's horrendous. Right, and that extreme poverty that now I, have, I can measure it in one simple way, which I don't understand the details of how the one dollar a day and the PPP, the purchasing power of poverty, who cares? But just the uh, just that having one single um, uh, indicator that in which pe people could picture what the problem is was extremely important. Now, the other important thing of that one dollar a day is that when you went then to the countries, actually the countries were not necessarily measuring, I mean, their important measure at the country level was not necessarily the $1 a day in Peru, right? But it was their national extreme poverty indicator. But it doesn't matter, right? It was just the issue that, okay, extreme poverty is something that has to be defeated, right? And then nationally, I'm gonna measure, I'm gonna be measuring it this other way. Right, with my own national basket of consumption, etc. Great, right? Because it's the same concept, and doesn't matter that at the national level you measure it a little bit different. That's okay. I think that's something that we're trying to move in terms of the education world. I think the SDG framework is the right one, but I I agree with the um, with Nick's point that we have too many indicators. Uh, and too many goals that many of them are really unreachable, right? We're talking about in 2030, high quality secondary education for all, right? That's not gonna happen because, I mean, just secondary education for all would not happen, right? Even less quality. I think we should be, are we sure that quality primary education for all will happen or not? So we really, there's a disconnection in terms of the level of, of um, I mean, the, the target that has been defined. So that's why one of the things that we're trying to move is to have, let's start with one single indicator that everyone can understand, right? That's why we're developing this learning poverty indicator that we have discussed with most of the people here in the, um, in, 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 in the panel, that it's, what's the percentage of kids who can understand, read and understand a sports story at age 10? Why, why I like that indicator? <clears throat> because I don't have to explain it, right? Everyone, every parent, right, will understand what that indicator is. How many kids can read and understand a simple story at age 10? 
period. That doesn't require any more explanation, right? So, and, and we know that uh, tragically, that number in the developing world, low and middle income countries is only a little bit more than um, 50%, right? So that learning poverty is a little bit more than 50%. And in low income countries in Sub-Saharan Africa is 80%, right? But just that gives also a simple and gives a sense of urgency of something that we should treat in the same way that they treat that we treat hunger, that we treat extreme poverty, uh, that we, we treat stunting, right? It's something that for any other education outcome, that has to happen. Right. So I, I think I think that 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 is something that will help, right, in terms of rallying not these people, I mean, no offense, not people in this room. I mean, by rallying people at the country level. Now, at the country level, many there are discrepancies on exactly how you measure how you measure that, but that doesn't matter. The key is the, 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 the main point is that all kids should be able to read when they finish primary. Right? All kids should be able to read. And if your country is not attaining that, then you have a huge problem that actually compromises any other education outcome that you are interested in. And, and one thing that, I mean, uh, and I finish with this, I think, I think it would be, we should have had uh, UNESCO here. Uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what 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 happened about it. I, I because there are many things in terms of the discussions of the goals, in terms of measurement, uh, in terms of um, in terms of monitoring, in which their role is and will continue being crucial. So um, I, I think we should take the voice of UNESCO uh, one way or the other, so that this this discussion is is, is, is even more fruitful. Great. Thank you so much, Jaime. That's a very interesting idea for um, this new. Um, targeted metric, um, lessons learned from other sectors. I very much appreciate that. I want to just take us back for a quick moment to this question of leadership. And I'm wondering, um, so anyone in support of a new UN agency? Pardon? Any, any of you in support of a new UN agency? As no. Nick, you can raise your hand. We'll be like the Democratic debates. Raise your hand if you support the UN agency. <laughs> yeah. Yes. He wants to talk. No. It's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> I know Julie is not in support. Uh, she, she made her point, but anyone yeah. else? Some of us uh, have seen the destruction of UNESCO and its leadership from the other side mm -hmm. in our Minister of Education. Mm -hmm. And many of us almost were able to foretell what was going to happen if UNESCO was going to be emasculated. So in a sense, we are now reaping the reward of our own actions. Um, as for whether we need a new organization or not, my own take would be to fix the problems in UNESCO, whatever it takes. Because we need leadership in education, just like WHO plays in education. I need help. I think it's going to be very difficult to make much more progress. Financing is different, mm -hmm. but I think leadership is critical. And at the moment, we don't have that leadership. Okay, so fix UNESCO. That's the um, and we did invite UNESCO to be here. They are in Paris, so it was a little difficult to get them here. Um, any other thoughts? So we we did have a discussion a bit about coordination in especially in countries, which doesn't go all the way to creating a whole new agency. But I'm curious if anyone has thoughts on how there could be better coordination um, and decision making across the existing agencies that might lead to better outcomes for countries rather than sending countries in lots of different directions. If Robert, I can, I think the problem is, or one of the challenges, and I'm not sure if Joe will agree with me on this, but is we are overly focused and weighted on the planning process at national level and not on the implementation um, and what happens afterwards. And those of you who have worked at country level will know there is a whole sort of industry that flies in and supports a development of a, and we can call it many different things, and we have over the, over the years, education sector plans, national development plans that have education chapter, et cetera time of an emergency. Um, we have a whole cluster system. And I remember chairing the first meeting at a cyclone in Mozambique. Uh, all the agencies were represented. There was this many people in the room um, to plan the response and education. So there's no lack of effort there. Then six months later, a year later, what happens on the implementation side? 
that's where everyone goes back to their headquarters, I guess, argues with Nick on what to happen globally, but nobody is supporting anymore. And the feedback loop then, but um, to the, uh, at national level to hang on, why hasn't any of that translated into action? That's the key. Um, so I think that's the misdirected now. We all develop these nice documents at national level, go home. Very few agencies, UNICEF being one of them, I'll be frank, has a presence in those countries are left trying to continue to hold the ball and meet accountability requirements globally. So number one takeaway I'd like to share is focus on the implementation of the agreed national plans. And that is very political. That's, uh, that requires hand-holding on a day-to-day -day basis at national level. Okay, thanks Rob. Um, Joe, did you wanna comment on how to improve I'll just disagree with you, so I thought I'd better come in and say, I won't disagree with you. Um, I mean, you know, one of the things I have to point out being the member of the GP Secretariat now is that my board is pretty much sitting on my right and a few people in the, <laughs> in the room as well. And of course, we're going through a process at the moment of determining where GPE might go with its new strategy. But one of the questions we have put out for the, in the consultation is how do we tackle this issue of implementation? Because we're seeing from all of the evidence that we've amassed across all the countries where we work with our partners that implementation is is key we need to evolve this idea of you know you have a you have a good plan and that's the job done to one in which we are better at supporting governments in implementing prioritizing and implementing those priorities and one of the things i would just pick up a little bit on that point is you know nick in your grading of of, of all the different pieces and you picked up on monitoring um if you look at the global level, I would probably agree with a grade C. If you look at the country level, I would downgrade it quite significantly. Um, and we are seeing that, you know, our partners, our government partners and our develop and our donors, and you guys all sitting on the panel as well, including UNICEF, are not necessarily stepping up to this idea that we need to be working with government to jointly monitor the progress that they are making within their sector. We are doing the plan and then we're going off and we're doing our own things and we're saying, well, we're, we're under the plan, we're under the plan because it's such a broad umbrella of a plan, rather than actually rigorously saying, these are the things that we need to move in the next year. How's it going? How do we course correct? What data do we use to course correct in order to move towards better implementation? So that comes to that issue um, of how do we align better a country. And one final point, I think this stat is from you, Jaime, when we were in Seattle together meeting with Gates, not arguing with each other. Um, in, in Africa, many ministers of education have a, have a tenure of what, 18 months, 24 months? So when we're thinking about this issue of leadership and political leadership, we need to be aware of <laughs> the change um, and how do we handle that and how do we support the leadership at country level that we need. Great, thank you so much, Joe. Let me get Julie in and then I'll come back to you, Jaime, in a moment. What are your thoughts about how we could do a better job of coordinating in countries? Uh, this goes a little bit into what my recommendations are going to are around the question that you're going to ask me. <laughs> but, but I think this idea I comment on financing as well. Too. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. So um, this idea of, of recognizing our role um, and how we can be increasing our efficiency and our effectiveness. As you know, we're kind of we're, we're working through that here in Washington, but. Um, you know, in my in all of my country visits, the first thing I do is sit down with everybody as as many people as I can at one table as soon as we get there, and um, or as soon as I'm there. And you know, some places that works really great, and in other places it doesn't work at all. Um, GPE has a particularly important role to play in this, uh, in in my view, um, and I think getting to the implementation and really looking at how um, we're able to to be much more focused on outcomes, um, I think is 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 critical. Um, around the the idea, if you do you want me just to kind of pop into Yeah, well, I was I wanted question. to ask Julie, what well, let me just see, I think Jaime wanted to get in on this question of leadership and then I can come back to you on this question of financing unless there's more you would No, no, no. Say. I want to say one other thing, okay. just I think the general consensus of our of our whole panel, and I just want to reiterate that, which is our partnership with mm -hmm. Um, our country partners yes. and really focusing, as you all know, um, all of USAID is looking to, to, to reorient um, ourselves to be much more focused on that partnership on the ground um, and supporting country partners. Um, we fought um, quite hard 
in, and, and are continuing to do so in the multilateral forum to ensure that, that our country partners have a much bigger voice and that we have um, a realistic expectations among each other about what that partnership is and what we can achieve um, from a donor perspective with limited resources. So that tees me up for what the next question you okay. asked me. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to financing in a minute, but um, just one more point from Jaime on this question of how to better coordinate all the different agencies around um, opportunities and countries. So two, two, two thoughts on that. Um, one is I, I don't want to, um, uh, to have as a conclusion of this panel that we need to fix UNESCO, right? We need to fix it. probably, I mean, all of our institutions needs, needs to be fixed in the sense, not only of being more, each time more efficient internally, but each time more efficient in terms of the joint work. And I, I think that happens well, more at the, um, at the level of the capitals. And the main problem is, I think, at the level of the country, right? Um, so we, there was a meeting in, in Paris. I mean, Alice was there, not, not, not Joe, but I mean, uh, Rob was there and, and UNESCO was there and Education Commission was there. Uh, and one thing that was discussed precisely <coughs> was that one of the things in which we need to work together much more forcefully is in terms of driving this sense of urgency mm -hmm. that we don't see nor at the international level, nor right at the country level, right? Now, obviously at the country level is extremely heterogeneous. Those countries in which they have seen that sense of urgency in terms of delivering education the right way are the countries that have made it, right? And those in which we don't see that sense of urgency are countries in which they are not making it, right? So, I mean, the, uh, I, I, I think that we, we, need, we need to distinguish, distinguish um, the new grounds. And my second thought is I wanted to go uh, to what uh, both Joe and Bob has mentioned about the issue of implementation capacity, because it's something like it is the most complicated thing and uh, we end up not investing enough because probably we don't do ex we don't know well how to do it. But my sense is that we know much more about how a school, how a decent school should be run, yeah. right? That we know, right? How a fantastic school, maybe we can debate a lot, but a decent school, we know the recipe, right? So the problem of not being able to have those decent schools in the uh, 50,000 schools in Peru, right, is not a problem that we don't know the technology of how one school is run, is a problem of implementation at the system level, mm -hmm. right? And implementing the, the right way at a system level requires a very strong bureaucracy at the country level, right? But then having strong bureaucracies at the country level, that's the most difficult thing to do. Much easier is even, even for the uh, multilaterals and everyone who provides finance, financing needs to finance a program, an initiative, right? But okay, that's great, that's interesting. But <coughs> if you really want to have sustained change, right? The investment has to be in terms of supporting countries and making sure that they have the right bureaucracies so that the system, the the uh, the the the, uh, the service can be delivered in the right way in a sustained way. If that does not happen, if, if we don't do that in terms of improving their own capacity or our own cap our capacity when I was in Peru, your the, your capacity when you were in Zimbabwe, in Zimbabwe, that is very difficult to make problems. Right, thank you. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of agreement that the agencies need to work better together. They need to work be better together in countries and particularly on this issue of implementation and supporting strong systems. Um, I guess the question I'd like to turn to next broadly is what can, the obvious question, what can all the agencies be doing to better support countries? And there is this question of do, do, does there need to be more global money? Is that, is the big problem that um, there's not enough money going into the system. And I wanted to turn first to Julie and get your thoughts on that. Is there enough money and is it of the right kind? Um, do we have the right types of instruments, et cetera? Uh, so I think everyone can agree, we all agree that there's insufficient um, funding for education writ large. Uh, I don't think there's no disagreement around that. Um, uh, uh, but I don't think increased funding from the donor community, I'll represent my, my constituency here. Um, first off, it's, 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 it's just frankly not available. 
Um, and so I think we need to be realistic about what um, uh, the, the level of funding from um, there, there. There really isn't, in my view, there's no check big enough that's going to fix this problem unless we look at ourselves in a, in a really in a different way and understand what our unique roles are in each one in each uh, forum that we that we work. Um, you know, Brookings just re I think recently released a, a report around um, that that supports that around looking at domestic resource mobilization and taxes, um, uh, the private sector um, and remittances dwarf aid. And more importantly, I think then then recognize that the recognition that that was a good direction. Um, so uh, and I, so uh, increasing bilateral multilateral funding, I don't think is going to is going to as I say, fix the answer or is realistic um, in many of the donor community countries. Um, so what does that mean? So uh, we've all talked a lot about um, the efficiency and, and effectiveness. Um, I think the development community writ large tends to say, and the way we talk also, you know, it's always about billions and trillions and millions of dollars. Um, and, um, and, and, and that's just, I, I feel very strongly that when you, you know, a new entity or, or um, big checks are not what is going to fix it. Um, uh, dollars spent kind of creating new things um, that are pooling from the same resources, uh, I think is counterproductive. Uh, so how do we be more effective and efficient where we are? Uh, secondly, um, how do we look at ourselves differently and what our unique role is within the environment? Um, what I'm finding really heartening and, and exciting about this conversation is the, the you know, the, the hundred percent focus on working with our donor countries in a more effective and realistic way and being hypersensitive and hyper focused on country context. Um, Zinga, I think your 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 uh, comment on demand driven is extremely important, um, both from a financing perspective and where does that come from, but also listening to the demands of our country partners, the parents, and the com at the at the community level and what that looks like, um, and how do we listen more effectively to those relationships and at the reforms that our country partners are trying to uh, to institute. Um, thirdly, um, I think uh, hitting on Nick's point and some of the others is looking at the opportunity that we all have in working with the private sector across the entire innovation um, spectrum. Uh, and your point about AI and um, uh, there, there are multiple ways that the private sector can help and it's not just non-state schools. Um, in fact, it's mostly not non-state schools, um, but they are able to, I've sat through recently um, some very in-depth and intense uh, co-creation workshops um, with the private sector um, on another issue. Um, and it is, it was within the first two hours immediately clear that very quickly um, we will be irrelevant in a lot of ways. Um, and we being the donor community, so how do we leverage what we do really well? And it's not necessarily, our value is not necessarily in writing a check, although certainly that's important. Um, but it's supporting, in, in, in addition to supporting GPE and others um, around the table, but it's how do we help um, our country partners in the reform effort and the governance structures, in um, the regulatory structures, uh, and how do we um, help ensure that this, the work that's being done at, that, at, at the country level with ourselves and countries and others, but also with the private sector and not, let's make sure they're at the table because they actually don't, they want to do development well. And that's what we know how to do. And so by excluding them and having them not at the table, that creates, um, uh, that's not how you build relationships. Um, and so, uh, so um, those are my three areas of, of on financing. Great, thank you. So thanks for leading us off on this topic of financing, this question, is there enough? Should there be more? Would that be solve the problems? Uh, also this question of, is it the right kind of funding? We already heard from Rob who mentioned that maybe 
there isn't a need for more specific support, but more general to support implementation. We heard from Joe earlier that she wasn't sure a specific mechanism for global public goods made sense, but that there should be more funding for global public goods as Nick has put out there. Does anyone have anything different that they want to add on this financing question? Zingai. Um, I'll make two points. The first point is that Nick and others are right that the case of sub-Saharan Africa is special. There are similar are not enough resources to support the kind of education systems many of those countries need. But I think it's also important, now I'm wearing my Harvard University Leadership Program hat, uh, it's also important to understand that efficient utilization of money is important. Because if you look at two particular cases, if you look at Namibia and South Africa, per capita they spend probably the same amount of money as South Korea does. But in terms of products, they probably don't produce much more than Lesotho, which spends a quarter of what they spend. So, so the issue is, I think efficient <coughs> utilization of money is a key issue that we want to assist countries with. One of the things that we have discovered at Harvard with the ministers is that they often realize that they are not using their resources efficiently. They often realize that it's not enough just to go to the Minister of Finance and say one money. It's more important to say to the Minister of Finance, oh, with this money you are doing, I can do this, I can save this, I can do that, but still I need a little bit more money. And those ministers who usually do that get more money. So I would say that really, in education, one of the biggest challenges we face is the issue of using money efficiently. Uh, one of the interesting things is, of course, now we know a lot about ECT, is if you look at uh, a typical African country, the number of children who repeat grades, and if you actually factor that money, it rises into billions of dollars, which are literally going down the hill. Whereas if you could make the system efficient, you are already generating a lot of resources within the system. So I think those who are talking about the importance of uh, implementation are right. And at Harvard, we have, we have uh, Michael Blair, uh, who used to hear Don Blair's, uh, no, Michael <laughs> Baba, who used to hear Don Blair's delivery unit. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, and he comes and he spends a day um, with Idris from uh, Malaysia, who also has produced this program developed the same program, <coughs> really walking the ministers through the importance of implementation. And since we follow many of these ministers in the field after Harvard, we already begin to see some differences. But as some would say, of course, if they get changed, then you have to start the process. Of but implementation, I would say, is important. Efficient utilization of resources. In fact, I would say, if you put good money into a system that is inefficient, you're wasting money. That's a great segue to maybe talk a little bit about how can we support um, countries with implementation of what we know works. And I don't know if you want to comment on that, Rob, or if you want to continue the discussion on financing, that's fine too. But maybe we can start to move into the how do we how do these agencies, the, the global architecture, support implementation? I'm happy to move to the how. Is that uh, my question, or is that somebody? Um, <laughs> Let me let me mention one thing before going to the agenda of financing. Yeah. Just an issue of balance here. Because I, I, I think it's wrong to say, okay, efficiency is a problem only, right? It, it is a huge problem. And that the discussion that the Minister of Education will have with the Minister of Finance is that they will say, why do you want more money, right? If you have ghost teachers, if 70% of your teachers are apps or 30% of your teachers are absent, et cetera, there's a lot of room for, for improvement efficiency. Why do you need more money? Right. And it is true that money can be used more efficiently. But on the other side, look, but my enrollments in early childhood education were 40 percent. 
right? In rural, in rural areas, there are just no schools. So there is no way that they can be more efficient because they just don't exist, right? Uh, so that requ will require more money, right? If you want to change the status of the, of the teaching career, that will require more money. Now, it's not only more money, you need to have the right career and the right incentives. You have to do it well, of course. But it's we need to always have the balance. You need more resources, right? And they have to be well spent. But in this issue of sense of urgency, we're saying more money is needed from the international community. Yes, of course, more money is needed, particularly for global public goods, as Joe was saying. But at the country level, much more money is needed because that's where the answer is, right? I mean, the international money is less than two percent of what's spent on education. Everything is spent at the country level. Right, and Nigeria today spends two hundred dollars per student. Right, uh, will that be solved by any international organization? No, impossible. The scale is huge. It has to be solved by the social contracts in Nigeria. But it's just a matter of just being more efficient with their two hundred dollars that they are spending today. Well, obviously not. Yes, they have to be more more efficient, but they need more than the two hundred dollars. Right, the the the, uh, the OECD countries spend what seven thousand, eight thousand. Right, so very difficult that with $200, even if you are hyper efficient, yeah. right, you, you will give the education that you that all kids deserve. Great, great point. Rob, why don't you go ahead? Well, maybe it's just to build on what I mean, said again, but I, um, I mean, I think the per unit per child uh, uh, amount of public resources per child is not that helpful of an indicator. It is that we need overall more money. Okay. But maybe we just agree to that. Um, I think instead it's which child received the money. If we're just going to talk now about financing and it links to accountability and this comes back to Africa and actually having two ministers, it'd be interesting to be, former ministers, it'd be interesting to hear their thoughts. How does the international community influence national decision making to ensure more progressive allocation of public resources in education? That to me is a yeah. key question. The reality is if we take across many countries across Africa and Asia and many least developed countries, we have a very real imbalance in how public resources are allocated in the education sector to the point of the top 20% of income earners get six, $7 per $1 to the bottom 20%. So how do we shift instead of into universities or very fancy schools in capital cities to early childhood education centers and very remote locations? And the reality of that is not, we call it to be nice, I think, internationally, implementation capacity. It's got nothing that, and I'm surprised um, to hear, you know, ministers came to a global workshop and their eyes opened that, oh, it's good to invest in early childhood education. Everyone knows it's good to invest in early childhood education. It's the highest return of investment in education, early childhood education. More kids and why we don't is because of vested interest in politics and very in national level that it encourages allocation of public resources to high profile schools in capital cities. So how does the international community influence your successors to allocate resources more progressively? And sure, UNICEF tries and many others try. That's not going to be fixed at the international architecture. That's fixed in the conversations at national level. I come back to my point of how many times have we been involved in national level processes that set allocation targets and then a year later, they're not held up. Then the last thing I'll say is the problem here from a UN perspective is what do we do in countries that we don't actually agree with the allocations that are made by the government? Because the reality is the five year old didn't elect that mm -hmm. minister. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're there because of the five year old. And this is how I have spent my life. So if we're going to reflect back on our careers, what have I done in, I don't know if anyone's here from Myanmar, North Korea, places I've served in. So I'm sorry, five-year-olds, what am I going to do for the poor Burmese kid in the northern Myanmar? And his country quite openly, when I was there, said, we don't care about the education of a five-year-old in the middle of nowhere. So then what does the UN do in that case? Well, we pick up the slack and we use the little bit of resources we have to provide whatever learning opportunity we can to that five-year-old. But that's not sustainable. So my question to the former ministers is, how do we influence your successors? Okay. <laughs> and then we'll come back to the question of TA with Joe. But yeah, do you guys have thoughts about how we influence? And I think this gets to the question of accountability. We talked about the need for accountability among the global institutions, but there is a challenge when you have national governments that aren't being accountable to the needs. How, how can we promote that? So just 
I mean, that, that will be a long discussion, but just one thought on that, which is that I think the discussion about education is not a discussion only with the Minister <coughs> of Education, right? The discussion of education with the Minister of Education and the Minister of Health and the Minister of Finance, right? And the Prime Minister or whoever is, 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 is in charge. And, and that's why the key point is that this message about the urgency is not for the people in the education community. It's outside precisely the education community, right? So there has to, what, what we don't see is an internalization from the perspective of the Minister of Finance, right? Of what is at stake when you're talking about education, right? You cannot say, well, it's a social investment or a social expenditure, it's a social sector. Yes, it is a social sector because we're talking about people, right? But it is in the, in the long run, that's what you, that's what define your competitiveness. Because assuming you're, I mean, as a minister of finance, you should be worried about that, right? Uh, okay, so by the way, this is critical for that. And also, education is, even in the countries where it's not spending enough, is a large sector, right? It could be between between 15% or 20% of public expenditures. So in some middle-income countries, it's a fifth of the state. So you can change aggregate demand through the education sector. So education sector is a macro sector. Right. So even in the in the short run, in the long run, you should see education in a completely different way. Right. But that is a discussion that we need to have with the Minister of Finance. Right. Not necessarily only with the Minister with the Minister of Education. So that I, I, I think that opening the debate. Right. And the uh, and the and making sure that there is an internalization of the needs. Right. Is something that we need to do outside the education sector. Yes. I, I see there's a minister, a former minister here in Liberia. <laughs> I, um, I could not agree more with him. I think that uh, to be successful in education, uh, if I look at my own experience, you have to go beyond the confines of the Minister of Education. Because education is highly political, and the number of stakeholders in it are huge. And it's very important if you are going to succeed to be able to satisfy at least the minimum demand of the constituents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then the constituents is big. In the case of Zimbabwe, I spend a lot of time, what I sometimes say, in three hour weeks. I would talk to factory owners. I would say to them, what kind of product do you want to come from Moscow City? I, I would talk to parents. I, I would talk to traders. I would talk to everybody. Mm -hmm. So you need to talk to your, to your prime minister, your minister of finance. Yeah. And other ministers who are interested in education. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very important issue to appreciate that education is highly political. That the constituency is huge. I often say to people, you know, the problem with education is that everybody went to school. So everybody, <laughs> everybody thinks, knows you know, what yeah. <laughs> about education, what's the problem? That's great. Thank you. Good question to the ministers. I, let's talk about one final theme and then we're going to go to the audience. And that is this theme, I think, getting back to implementation. There is this question, Nick um, um, uh, suggested that, that we don't know enough about what works um, and we're not doing a good job of getting what we know works um, into practice in countries. And I'm curious, Joe, if you could talk a little bit about the state of the architecture for technical assistance and how well is that working? Uh, what can we be doing to improve that? So there's a real risk that this is a very dry answer. So before I do the dry answer, um, I actually want to pick up on Rob's point, but also, you know, Zinga said everybody went to school. Actually, that's the point. Everybody is not in school. And, and what Rob's talked about here, this, this point about equity, where the finances are going. I think, you know, when we talk about having maybe a single learning goal, we, are, we ought to get much, much sharper on this equity point. Um, you know, I'm struck when I talk, I'll talk about, you know, how do we build data systems or, you know, how do we improve the measurement of learning and all of those pieces? There are vast numbers of children who are not in those systems. We're not counting. Them. And any system does not count the children who have been pushed out of school. Let us remember that. Mm. Okay, so when we talk about equity, we need to talk about those. Working with our governments on secondary education, on our lessons. 
Poor kids aren't there. They're nowhere in those systems. They're already pushed out. So when we, so just, I mean, I got quite emotional when you talked about that because it's such an important issue. This, this, this sharpening of equity. And when we talk about systems, we need to be very clear that we're helping government strengthen systems for all children, but particularly those who that are just invisible or semi-visible within the data. So that's my little uh, passionate rant. Um, to pick up on the issue of technical assistance and capacity. I mean, we talked about implementation. I think Jaime talked, started talking a bit about the, the messiness of supporting systems. And I think that's a really important starting point. Um, you know, when you look at the literature that talks about which education systems have improved, you do see some commonalities within those systems, just as you see commonalities around decent schools. But what you don't see when you try to plot their journey is they all started in the same place and followed the same route. They all started in slightly different places. And what is common is that they aligned those reforms. So they, did, they went in, they said, we're going to try reforming X, let's say curriculum, but then we're going to make sure that that's perfectly aligned with what our teachers are doing, how we're assessing, et cetera, et cetera. So that idea that you're aligning within a system, which is messier and harder to do, and I think gives us some real challenges around how we might support governments in their reform processes. So three sort of quick thoughts on that, and then maybe a couple of sort of examples where I think we might be seeing some progress. Um, I mean, one is I think we need to rely a little less on what I might call the sort of the technocratic and static evidence. You know, this is how you do a plan. This is how you do this. This is how you do that. You know, that sort of beamed in from on high. Um, it, it, those things are important, but they're not the answer. Um, and it's how we think, and this is my second point, about how we as an international community can be much more responsive and much more adaptive, much more led by the countries efforts for reforms and then need to think about well you know what are the incentives to getting involved in that so i talked a little bit about how do we incentivize demand for evidence for example or how do we incentivize and use the financing that we do bring to incentivize the investment in those pieces that are going to make the biggest impact and that are government led and you know i'll give you a couple of promising examples and then i think the third bit when we think about technical assistance and i guess that this is partly coming from some of my prior roles also as sort of being head of profession in, in DFID and then going into EINSA, is that there's, there's two sorts of different types of demand for technical assistance. And some of it's sort of this accompanying government along a reform process, which I think is super important. But some of it's very, very detailed and technical. And, you know, and, and Nick picks up on this in, the, in his paper. I think it's kind of quite shocking that we haven't been able to make more progress on purchasing of textbooks. <laughs> yeah, really? I mean, we know, and that's quite a technical piece to help government with their procurement system so that they can bring down the cost of textbooks from $10 per child to $3 per child, thereby being able to flood it to have a constant. You know, that's quite a technical piece, and you need quite detailed technical assistance to help and support government in that way. So, do we actually have capacity on those very technical pieces as well as the more sort of reform minded pieces? Um, and then just to think, I mean, one of the things that, that we have in, in, in GPE, and we're all GPE here, so that's us, is we have this, um, what we call variable part or, or financing, which is results-based finance. 30% of our grants is results-based um, and asks governments to choose indicators roughly in either you know, around equity, learning and efficiencies. And they choose those indicators. Now, it's too soon to really thoroughly evaluate the impact of those things, but we do see some things that are emerging. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is that the discussion around those indicators at country level is, is quite robust in many cases, you know, because people are, there's some stakes on the table. You know, what is it that we actually think we can achieve in the next two or three years in this particular issue? How are we going to measure it and how are we going to align our capacity up behind it to deliver? And if we're not delivering and if we're off track, what more do we need? So just having that dialogue is something that we're beginning to see. Um, the second thing we're beginning to see is we're beginning to see some of our grant financing aligned behind those indicators. Um, so, for example, um, in, in Nepal, they're actually using much of their own in-house, no international technical assistance, but they're taking something that worked um, in one area, looking at out-of-school children, looking at how they can scale that out 
um, across the nation um, because there's that sort of incentive. And they're aligning their own technical assistance behind that, not international. Um, in Malawi, they've chosen allocation of teachers and particularly more equitable allocation of teachers. And that is bringing together um, partners on the ground to align their technical assistance with the government's aspiration to move forward on that. So we're seeing that alignment um, piece. And I know Liberia, because George is in the room, um, Liberia chose to use some of its financing for supporting its data systems and improving data systems. So we are seeing, I think, what is some fairly um, positive moves in that area. And I think just to end on two points on this to end is um, one that perhaps less positive thing we're seeing is we're not seeing that having particularly big impact on domestic financing. So that's an area where, you know, then perhaps limitations to how financing can incentivize for all the reasons we've talked about. But an area where we are seeing a positive is that these um, reforms that I'm talking about are sector wide. They're not projects. They're government led and they're sector wide. And I think that's great. Thank you. Lots of really great food for thought. I'm curious before we go to the audience, if anyone has anything different they'd like to add. We already we heard from Rob earlier. Fewer projects, more focused on sector-wide approaches, which Joe has mentioned, GP is going in that in that direction. Nick also had suggested that we could better align um, financing and technical assistance, which it sounds like you're attempting to do. Any other thoughts or, or ideas or places where you've seen technical assistance really work well? I think I also mentioned some of what's happening at the Harvard Ministerial Leadership Initiative and that um, supporting ministers. Other other thoughts? Or shall we go to the audience? <laughs> I can tell they're, they're talking about it. Okay, well, we've had a great discussion on a number of themes, probably more we could have covered. But why don't we take um, questions or views on, but please keep, please, number one, introduce yourself, tell us who you are, and please keep your, your comments brief, um, whether they're a question or a response to something someone said. Yes, I'm in the pink right there. Hi, I'm Heather Simpson with... Hi, I'm Heather Simpson with Room to Read. Thank you very much. I'm curious to understand um, if you think we can come up with a common theory of change that the, the development sort of structure, the, the bilateral, multilateral can agree upon, and we as implementing organizations and others can feed into it. And then it could help capture this, this tension between the need to have a very simple communication strategy that can inspire, and I agree with reading as fundamental, it's certainly what we do, but then have an articulation of how we can translate that inspirational message to the bureaucratic supporting those bureaucracies to transform because that's what we see when we have this inspiration message of getting more children into school which i would argue the mdgs distilled down to that message it then resulted in these big enrollment figures sometimes just names on a paper and didn't follow up with strengthening the bureaucracies to actually handle the, the enrollment figures and actually lead to learning. So how can we have a theory of change that can deal with both strengthening the bureaucracies and have an inspirational message? Great, thanks. And let's do a few more. Um, yes, red tie, since you're there, and then we'll go to the other side. Hi, Will Clorman from Iketabu. Um, I'm going to try to keep this very short because you're saying we should. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for a really fascinating discussion. And Nick, coming back to your beginning, um, I, I appreciate that you're pointing us in the direction of architecture. Um, because I think, and, and a number of people are picking up on this in the comments you've made, and I'm, I'm trying to, I think there's so much that's in the comments you've made that points in this direction of architecture. And I'm, I'm trying to understand if it's, if I'm just hopeful, or if there's something that, if, if there's, architecture that I can almost see is is a functioning system. Um, so to Jaime's point about that magical metric, that unifying rallying point of a metric that, uh, that, that, that can underpin action, that can rally people around it, governments at local level, to Julie's point about country context and the criticality of the local government owning what change can happen. I, I mean, I, I, I wonder, if what I'm hearing, apart from the money, let's set the money over there, and Julie has said that definitively. Are some of you saying, and Joe, you were just picking up on this a moment ago, are some of you saying that 
evidence is some currency. Evidence is some hopeful resource that can flow through the circuits of this architecture and get people on board, get countries on board with common ideas. Maybe it's adapted for their context. Maybe, as you say, Jaime, it's not really about, and Joe's point too, it's not about templates. It's not about use this, thou shalt measure this way, but somehow capturing the imperative in a measurable manner and flowing the evidence through the architecture rather than just the money. Thanks. Yes, right here. Uh, Steve Cleese, University of Maryland. Thank you for a great panel. Um, some of the panelists talk about being more realistic. Uh, we've been promising something simple, like universal primary education since the 1960s. It's not going to be achieved in current efforts by 2030. That's 70 years of promises for something straightforward. The performance has been abysmal. You talk about connecting education with other areas. When you think about the international education architecture, you need to think about the international development architecture. That's what's broken, and education is a part of that. We need, endless, we, we need so many more resources for development. I mean, we need that 0.7%. That's been promised for a long time. We need the UN to be able to tax and spend. Apologies to Jaime, but you know, the. The, the World Bank and the, and the IMF have been leading the development effort, and they've not been successful, and they've not been democratic. It's 75 years of Bretton Woods institutions. We need to revisit Bretton Woods. And lastly, uh, Nick talked about the private sector. Julie did, too. From my point of view, we have entirely too much influence of the private sector. If you look at the development architecture, you look at the World Economic Forum, you look at what they call the Global Redesign Initiative, which is to transform the UN into a big public-private partnership, we need to reconsider the development architecture. There's a number of, of blogs by NORAG responding to uh, Nick's article. I have one of them that talks about some of these issues. I'd ask the panel to think about the development architecture as the underlying problem. Great. Thanks, Steve. Let's take one more. Is there one more from right here in the yellow? And then we'll come back to the panel first. Hello, my name is Emilie de Bled. I am with Investisseur et Partenaire. Uh, it's a French uh, group. And we are now working on a new program, impact investing program called Education to Employment, focused on SMEs in Africa. And I was also curious about the point that uh, this gentleman made about the private sector's contribution and the role you see in the DOMIO community as a whole, but also in each of your institutions of what kind of tools, uh, what kind of um, influence you can have in order to increase partnerships between local and uh, public and private sectors. Uh, to increase its contribution to the achievement of the SDG4. Great, thanks. Okay, let's turn back to the panel. We have an interesting question on whether there's a p potential for developing a theory of change <laughs> that all of the agencies might be able to agree to that communicates things simply, but also talks about the how. Um, we have a question about, is evidence really the currency that needs to flow through this? There's a question about the international aid architecture and does that need to change? And a question about the private sector and their role. So not everyone needs to respond to each thing, but I'm gonna just quickly go down and see if anyone wants to comment on any of those. Go ahead, Julie, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Uh, so first off, thank you guys for really thoughtful questions. Um, I'm going to quickly just run through my thoughts. Um, uh, I will leave a theory of change question to my other colleagues on the on the uh, on the on the, on the panel. Um, the uh, I absolutely believe that evidence and data are part of what I think everyone and everybody's organization up here can contribute to um, this global good, and I do think it is a currency. Um, if you talk to others in the health field and, and um, other sectors, um, or if just the work that we do, we know that we're not sharing the way we should be, just even in country amongst the people sitting around that table, let alone the more broader opportunities I think we all have around that. Data is 
um, and using data and evidence for better decision making, both for us in Washington, but also importantly for our country partners. How do we, as, a, as part of that education architecture, um, fulfill that promise to achieve better efficiency, better effectiveness, um, and better systemic uh, approaches? Um, so full stop, absolutely 100%, at least from USAID's perspective. Um, uh, um, uh, Mr. Cleese, I think your point on um, the development architecture in general is broken. Um, couldn't agree more. I'll leave it at that. I'm, I'm sure we agree and also disagree on other areas, but um, but certainly um, uh, how we get, I, you know, how, what that looks like and, and how to change that. Um, I think is going to be a broader debate um, and is that's ongoing. Uh, um, and then lastly, um, uh, Madame, the um, uh, part of what I think we need to do more effectively, particularly in the workforce environment um, and, and sector is listening to job providers um, and helping our country partners acknowledge that the, 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 the growth comes from SMEs and others, and how do we inspire that by working with labor ministers um, and, and others um, as well in the private sector and really listening, what is it that you need to fulfill those jobs and to create that growth? Um, and, um, and again, that goes back to the value that all of us can bring um, that's outside of the check writing in terms of our convening power, our technical assistance, um, uh, and our ability to help our um, country partners look at the reforms across their cross-sectoral cabinet agencies to inspire that kind of growth that we must see coming out. And it has to start with kids that can read and write and, um, and do a, add and subtract um, so that they're able to, you know, uh, to respond to a growing, um, hopefully growing economic base. Um, and that will go into something I hope that we bring up later, which is about how do we also create leaders um, at the local level? Um, and um, uh, that is a much broader, harder question, um, but something that I think all of us should be 100% focused, 1,000% focused on in all of the sectors in which we work is how to create those softer skills that allow for leaders to emerge and bring um, uh, uh, to, to advance their countries. Um, so, great. Yep. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on any of the points the audience members made? Um, think I, um, I don't belong to an agent, so I won't answer any questions <laughs> <laughs> to agents. But uh, Smart. an issue was raised regarding uh, the promise of UPE and uh, why we haven't achieved it up to now. And that was also coupled with. Uh, I hope some kind of criticism about the World Bank and IMF, which I'm not going to because I attacked from the World Bank. Uh, and of course, uh, the issue of uh, <laughs> private schools. I, I want to address the issue of private schools because there's a lot of noise, especially from the global South, on private schools. Some of it is uninformed, if I might say so. If you look at uh, sub Saharan African countries, I can challenge anybody to name a single African country <clears throat> that has achieved UPE without the involvement of the non-government sector. I would like you to give me just one example of a country in Southern, in Sub-Saharan Africa that has been able to provide universal primary education without the involvement of the private sector. I think that uh, the needs of education in many of the countries of sub-Saharan Africa are such that we have no choice but to allow the private sector to play a role. What the government can do is really to regulate what the private sector does so that parents and the students are not cheated. But many parents are willing to sacrifice uh, the little money they've got to send their children to private school, why? Sometimes because the government school does not provide the quality education they need. More often because there are no government school around or no school around, and therefore there's only private school. So I, I think we need to, 
we need really to depoliticize the issue of private schools and, and understand that they are playing a role. In my case, in Zimbabwe, the majority of schools in Zimbabwe are private schools or non government schools. So I think we need to understand that. But in the case of Zimbabwe, even private schools get teacher supported, but they do other things like maintain buildings, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, pay non-teaching non staff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think we need to understand a little bit about this issue of private sector. One question I wanted to raise, which has not come up, and I think that Nick publicly referred this in his um, paper. <coughs> It is remarkable how education has remained so conservative when um, the internet has changed the way we do business in almost every other sense of the world. If you look at the challenges, I think, facing particular sub Saharan Africa, I really think we need to find new ways of delivering education in an efficient way using new technology. I think that's really an important area uh, that we need to explore. Thanks for those very powerful points. Does that, does that, any other <coughs> thoughts? Well, well, on? There, there are many topics here. So. <laughs> yeah, let, 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 you can talk about part, whatever you want. Let me park the issue of technology and the part of private education and address uh, the questions that, that were made about the uh, theory of change. And I, I also love this phrase, uh, Flow the evidence through the architecture. Yeah. Yeah. You have several tweetable yeah. uh, <laughs> here, but um, so let, let me say let me say one thing addressing these two these two uh, interventions. One is that yes, you need to have. Um, I think it's very useful to have an indicator in, indicators that can inspire and that could rally societies around something. Right. So here you want to rally society about it on, around education in general. And, and you say, well, by the way, within all the critical education outcomes, like there's one that it's kind of the basis for everything else. Right. And if you don't attain that reading ta reading target that every kid should learn, nothing else will, will be you will be able to attain. So I think and it's having a simple, powerful message is critical. However, it's critical what you're saying as well that Okay, so now what? Great. I mean, so to the public, you say, okay, let's rally with Congress, with everyone, you can use that. But then you go to finance or education or the, and say, okay, so what can we do? And what we cannot say, okay, let's have a reading program then. I mean, no offense to room to read that. That work is fantastic, but it's not about, okay, so let's do a reading program. No, no, this is about then, I wouldn't say a theory of change. Right, because if you're a minister, you don't want to have a theory of change being imposed to you by anyone. Right. However, there are a few things that can organize our thinking, right, and say, okay, but we need to have an approach, right, in general, right, in which you need to make sure that your learners are prepared, right, and you need to have the right early child education, and you need to have the right stimulation at home and the right nutrition. You need to make sure that you have the right teacher, that you prepare them well, you incentivize them well, and you make sure the right you choose the right people to be teachers. You need to make sure that inside the classroom there is the right teaching learning process. Fourth, you need to make sure that schools are a safe and peaceful environment in which you can you can you can you can work. And fifth, you need to manage the whole system. That system, I need to manage the school, right? So those five things for me, right? Prepare learners, teachers, the classroom, a safe school and the right management of the school and the system are things that we need to cover, that all countries should think about, are we addressing those issues in the right way, in the right way in order to have a, a, a functioning school and the right interaction between a student and a teacher? Because at the end of the day, all those things have to make sure that there's one teacher with one student and with the peers that are interact, interact, interacting in the right way, right? That's where the magic will, will happen. But, but all the system is needed to that. Now, in addition, we could have learning programs. There are specific interventions, right, related to uh, um, uh, to uh, to structured lessons, uh, coaching, the right training, the right technology in the classroom in order to make sure that the reading happens. Yes, of course, we need to have a learning policy package, but you need to have that overall structure, right, that will allow you to have a better a better a better system. So yes, you need to have. You need to have um, 
the inspiration, but you need to have the broad property policy framework and the specific policy. <laughs> now, when you go to the specifics, that's where you say this evidence issue is critical, right? Because it's easy to say we need to have the right teachers. We need to have a meritocratic career. We need to treat to train them well. OK, everybody will agree with that. Who will not disagree with all, all those things? So, OK, but then what's the specific right training and intervention, right? Is um, we should move out of the traditional training and move into coaching. Great, fantastic. OK, but then there are many parameters that you have to define in order to design the right coaching program. It's extremely difficult. Right, huge discussions about and that, about how to design that good coaching program, but then then that's where evidence is critical, right? And I would say that on evidence, what we need to what we need to make sure that we do not make the mistake. We say, okay, so let's have a pilot, let's evaluate, and five years from now, then when we learn after our RCT, then we'll do something. No, we cannot do that, right? We need to learn, evaluate at the same time that we implement. Right and have a process of adaptive learning continuously. Right, but with those key, those points are absolutely critical to re regarding policy and the use of added evidence that will complement and actually do the actions needed. Right, take us to the actions needed uh, once we have some inspirational target or something that will allow us society to rally around education. Great, I may. Um... All right, we'll do since we're going down. Unless, did you want to respond to his? It's yeah. almost like, okay. okay. We'll sorry, go with Joe and then Rob. You can. Sorry, Rob. Well, close yeah, out the last one. Um, <laughs> no, partly because, like Jaime, I mean, you know, my my sort of remarks come over this end of the room on those two questions. So I think I think I'm about to say something very similar, but because I really like the question about common theory of change. So as I said earlier, GP is going through its strategy process. GP is a partnership, so we all jointly own our current theory of change, and we have a body of knowledge that is beginning to suggest to us which bits of that theory of change still sound true and which bits may need to evolve moving forward. So I think, you know, we're in a reasonable situation actually to move towards, um, you know, potentially another shared theory of change under the GP partnership. And some of the questions I'm sort of grappling with, and again, you know, this is something the board may want to, to look at as well, and I've gone out in our survey, is exactly what you've talked about, about some of these tensions that we might want to bring together. So, you know, the one piece is that it's a valid question. Should GP potentially be adopting a single, you know, a single sharper outcome target that it might want to gather its 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 capacities and assets behind it's a question um, another question is you know we currently have a grant mechanism which allows us to support sector planning um, you know in what way and we're already beginning to do this in what way might we want to evolve that further so it is more responsive to supporting systems and all the various pieces of systems so that's a question so we've got a mechanism does it need to evolve further we have another mechanism which is more of the bigger sort of grant mechanism um, and then there's questions around that, you know, currently those grants tend to sort of fund a little bit of everything sometimes, you know, should we be thinking about how we could use those grants a little bit more, um, um, perhaps catalytically to support a government process in order to achieve a particular outcome reform, its teacher education program or whatever it wants to do. So be a little bit more prioritising our big grants. But then the, the, the other piece that I'm really keen on is exactly what the gentleman just said as well as and how do we get evidence to flow through all of that. And like Jaime said, this is not about static evidence that is created in the global north and disseminated to everybody else. It's about how can we actually get a much more iterative supply demand sharing conversation around evidence where we are supporting countries to test, to innovate and to course correct with better data. Um, and that's where, you know, we've launched KICS recently, but actually certainly in my thinking, how can we really hardwire that into both the GP model, more fundamentally hardwire the whole evidence piece into the whole architecture. Thanks, Joe. Right. I think I were, uh, very similar points to Jaime and Joe, but uh, the only thing I'm struggling with, I must admit, in this new job for the last three or four months is um, this expression that the world will never move as slow as it is today. Um, 
Meaning we, I feel like, like a global theory of change in the current pace of change that is happening in countries, it's like such a huge disconnect and such a theoretical conversation. Um, take technology change, take the role of the private sector. To say the role of the private sector, we're concerned it's overly involved. I'm sorry, it is what it is. Like it, we can talk about that, but there is no going back. Um, the role of the private sector in the provision of education and, and just surely from the demand of parents, it's not going to change. Um, plus, financing coming in the role of the public versus the role of myself as a, as a procurer of finance of my own private education, even in the most disadvantaged rural villages in India, people paying $8 a month to send their child to their local community private school. And here we are talking about a global theory of change. I, I just feel the disconnect is so enormous. So why I'm going through this personal reflection is maybe my job makes no, doesn't matter what in bed. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I gotta get myself back to where it matters. So I guess it's just, I think a dose of humility at the global level tweak what we can um, but focus in on empowering that local level to to find solutions in this incredibly fast moving uh, rob i think that's a great um sum, summary of, uh, i think everyone would agree i hope you don't decide you're just gonna you know give up your new job we, need to <laughs> um, we, we are nearly out of time but i wanted to just see if nick had oh there's yeah, there couple, is, we have a couple uh, more people that want to say. The was, Colombian oh. uh, mafia. <laughs> <laughs> He's my friend, by the way. He's my friend, of course. Nick, I still like you. <laughs> I, however, <laughs> no, 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 I, st I still like you. You had, uh, so Madeleine Albert would have said, the, the, the cojones to say it. <laughs> but I'm a little bit disappointed with the discussion because now I'm, I, I've done it. You know, I'm history. I, I'm now trying to teach students in China, Japan, and Georgetown not to make the same mistakes we made and i haven't learned that much from the discussion today even though you presented the, the, the opportunity to have a critical discussion and i still you believe we have it and the critical discussion emerged from the point when you start saying what about the country mm -hmm. uh, you know my tutor and mentor and birger and yourself and, and all of you uh, two years ago, we concluded that the best lesson we have learned is that the multilateral and bilateral institution cannot be more effective than what the country wants to be. And if you don't have a vision, you better get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> if, if the ministry has no vision, if the government has no vision, get away. Even though UNICEF is more difficult. But, but uh, as a development agent, I would run away because I have nothing to do there. So that's a discussion that I hope you people will have. You have been paid now to have that problem. And I, you know, I love UNICEF. I work with UNICEF in Mexico, in Guatemala, learning from them. But guys, you don't know education systems. That's a problem. And, and I love, I love DFID. Without defeat, I could have done anything in China in the early 2000s. But there are many people that have tried the technical assistance, institutional strengthening. Do not, do not forget about that. The World Bank has been doing this for 60 years. And the World Bank doesn't know how to solve the problem. IIEP <laughs> has been doing this for many years. And now you are telling me that GPE is going to solve it? I'm very concerned because EP has zero value added. So be careful. And doctor, if you think the World Bank and IMF uh, should be uh, changed, I agree with you. But think about a world without the World Bank and the IMF. By the way. Good point. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Lots of great food for thought. There's clearly lots of energy around this. Nick, do you want to have a quick last word on anything? Very quick, because we are over time. But uh, 
Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, so I'm glad to have uh, provoked a bit. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, first is, uh, uh, so the same way that uh, Gina made them say what they agreed and what they didn't agree, so I'll tell them what, say what I've agreed and what I don't agree. <laughs> so of course I agree about the urgency and I was glad to hear it, mm -hmm. but I wait to see if I, if I hear it next week. Um, second thing is I was very happy. Hear it in New York and in Washington. <laughs> okay, fine. I was very happy to hear from the uh, uh, left yeah. side, uh, which is interesting, it was on the left side, about the uh, uh, emphasis on the equity and so on. And I could not agree more. And by the way, I think the most important message in the Education Commission report that somehow has got forgotten about is about progressive universalism mm -hmm. and the fact you should do everything for everybody at the bottom and work your way up. Um, third thing, uh, this whole point about the national level, of course. Uh, I should have put it probably in the article, you just can't get everything in. Okay, that's my excuse, but uh, I think it's absolutely right. But I also don't think it's quite as straightforward as we have heard. Well, Jaime certainly referred to the difficulty of how you run dialogues with multiple agencies, but I also think that implementation is not as straightforward as it sounds. And this comes actually to a different aspect of the conservatism of education, a different one from the one that Zingai mentioned. Most people in charge of implementing things in education are former teachers. Mm -hmm. They are great, but they do not actually know anything about implementation. And that is a really big problem. It's not about, it's a structural problem. It's nothing about the individuals. Mm -hmm. And I hope no teacher would get offended by that. But I do think there's a serious lack of knowledge about implementation, whereas people who have been teachers and so on can actually feed into this conspiracy to only talk about planning. They can, they can sort of fit into that. But they can't fit well into this discussion about implementation. That's the first point. Second point in implementation, of course it must be done at the local level. Of course it must be monitored at the local level. But Rob, I think there is a job for you at the international level and others to look at the, all of that together. I